So I want to um, share a little bit about Ambassador Ross um, and then turn it over to, to you to share your wisdom this morning. Sure. Ambassador Dennis Ross is counselor and William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. For more than 12 years, Ambassador Ross played a leading role in shaping US involvement in the Middle East peace process, dealing directly with the parties as the US point man on the peace process in both the George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton administrations. He served two years as special assistant to President Obama and National Security Council Senior Director for the Central Region, and a year as Special Advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. Prior to his service as Special Middle East Coordinator under President Clinton, Ambassador Ross served as Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff in the first Bush administration. He played a prominent role in US policy towards the former Soviet Union, the unification of Germany and its integration into NATO, arms control negotiations, and the 1991 Gulf War coalition. During the Reagan administration, he served as director of Near East and South Asian Affairs at the National Security Council no. and as deputy what, what that was. of the Pentagon's <laughs> Office of Net Assessment. A graduate of UCLA, Ambassador Ross wrote his doctoral dissertation on Soviet decision making and served as executive director of the Berkeley Stanford program on Soviet international behavior. He received UCLA's highest medal and has been named UCLA alumnus of the year. Ambassador Ross is the author of five books on the peace process, the Middle East and international relations. Most recently, Be Strong and of Good Courage how Israel's most important leaders shaped its destiny, which was written with his colleague, David Makovsky, and was published this past September. So Ambassador Ross, we are honored to welcome you here today um, as our BZBI community um, has such a deep love of Israel and, and a desire to hear your wisdom on these times that we find ourselves in um, and what it might look like today moving forward um, towards peace. So thank you. For, for your time and for sharing your gifts with us this morning. Um, and I also wanna thank David Haas for helping to, to bring you here and helping to um, shepherd all of our technological needs during this time of our, our virtual Beit Midrash. So Ambassador Ross, um, welcome. Well, I'm grateful to learn from you this morning. All right, great, look, thank you for the welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, happy to do this and uh, as I say, to most places, the most Zoom talks that I now do, at some point I hope to actually see you all in the flesh as opposed to only virtually. Uh, but this is not, you know, given the circumstances, this is not a bad way to do things. Uh, obviously there's an awful lot that I could talk about. Uh, and I do, wanna, I do wanna be sure that I'm touching on what matters to you. Why don't I create a bit of a context for our discussion? Um, and, and again, as you, Look, as you saw from my background, what you know more than anything else is I'm sort of a grizzled veteran. I've been around a long time. I was a political appointee for two Republican presidents, Reagan and Bush 41, and a political appointee for Bill Clinton and for Barack Obama. So more than anything else, that makes me an extinct species, but it does allow me to kind of see things across the broad spectrum. and. Uh, I think you wouldn't be wrong if you thought that maybe I'm a centrist because that's kind of where I am. I'm kind of a centrist. Um, I want to say a word about the book because I can relate it to what's going on in Israel now. The, the book, Be Strong and of Good Courage, Hazak Ve'amatz, uh, is was written largely because uh, both my colleague David and I looked at Israel uh, and its and its future and we became concerned about the path that Israel was on from the standpoint of uh, if it stays on the path it's on, it will become one state for two people. And I want to relate this to the Trump plan and to possible annexation, which is very timely now. I want to create the context for this by, by saying the following. It's not an accident that we chose the title Be Strong and of Good Courage. Be Strong reflects the reality that Israel does not have a choice. Uh, there are too many who dismiss what Israel faces in the region, and in many ways, it's a miracle. 
Truly, Israel is a miracle in the sense that it has retained its democratic character, notwithstanding the reality that from the very first day of its existence, it faced war, it faced threats to its survival, uh, and wars in the Middle East, as we know today, even in a context where Israel is clearly the strongest power in the region, one of the strongest in the world, uh, is the startup nation. Uh, everything it's developed is extraordinary when you look at where it's come from and what it faced. Being strong is essential because the wars in the Middle East are not limited wars. If you have any doubts about that, look at Syria, you know, where you have 700,000 dead, uh, where you have more than half the population. They started the war with 23 million people. 12 million people are displaced, either inside the country or outside the country. Uh, the war is an absolute catastrophe from every conceivable dimension. The war before in Iraq, very much the same. What you see going on in Libya, very much the same. Uh, Israel faces threats from Iran, the Shia militias, from ISIS, from Al Qaeda, ISIS in the Sinai. Iran is embedding itself uh, in, in Syria, it has a precision guided project to put precision terminal guidance on uh, the tens of thousands, they have 130,000 rockets that Hezbollah has in Lebanon. So what Israel faces is not, the threats are not an illusion. Uh, they're very real, they're very tangible. Um, so Israel has to be strong. So the side of the title that says be strong reflects the reality of what Israel faces. Be of good courage means you also have to be wise. Uh, it means you have to see things as they are and you have to be guided by a sense of wisdom and understand uh, what you face in the future and how you have to contend with it. Uh, the pathway that Israel is on, as I said, is one that if it isn't changed, will become one state for two people. Now, we made an argument in the book at the end uh, that Israel will have to stop building outside the settlement blocks. The settlement blocks are those areas that are on about five to 6% of the West Bank, closest to the Green Line. But basically this is extending the border eastward about five or 6% and you absorb when you do that, more than 80% of all the settlers. Now, this concept of settlement blocks I actually developed when I was our negotiator during the Clinton administration and before we went to Camp David, because we knew the June 467 lines were not defensible or sustainable borders, either from a security standpoint or from the standpoint of, of the settlers, who at that point already numbered 300,000 across the Green Line. Uh, today, that number is more like 500,000. Uh, and the fact is you can, you can absorb the vast majority of the settlers uh, by absorbing the settlements that are, that are within these blocks. Uh, and we said, stop building outside the blocks. And this is a way to preserve the option of separation, even at a time when two states as an outcome is impossible, mostly, by the way, because of the Palestinians, not become of Israel, because of Israel. And I can get more into that in the Q&A. So the, the logic of the book was, all right, let's look back at is Israeli leaders, four in particular that we selected, based on a set of criteria. Uh, Mena, uh, David Ben-Gurion, Menachem Begin, Yitzhak Rabin, and Ariel Sharon. Four leaders who were very different ideologically, and I can also tell you very different personally. Their personal characteristics were very different, but they, for all their differences, they had the same approach to leadership. They approached the position of prime minister the same way. They all fundamentally had the same sense that being prime minister meant you assumed responsibility. You bore the weight of responsibility. Uh, these were people who took the notion of responsibility very seriously. Just as an example, when Yitzhak Rabin was prime minister the first time in the 1970s, for those of you who remember in Tebi, and for those of you who don't, I can explain it briefly, you had uh, an Israeli aircraft and LL plane hijacked to Uganda at a time when Idi Amin was a leader um, by, uh, by a group of Palestinian terrorists. Uh, in, in, uh, once the plane was hijacked, they demanded that all the prisoners that the Israelis were holding from like the, the Bader Meinhof gang, the Red Army, uh, Palestinian Liberation, and the PFLP, that they all be released or they would kill the Hashas. They released all the non-Jewish, all the non-Israelis. They kept all the Israelis. 
and and all the Jews who were on the plane. Uh, and there was no way to no way to get their release. So Rabin authorized a rescue mission. Now understand, this was like 3,000 kilometers away from Israel. You know, no, uh, you know, no access to the place, uh, hostile area. Uh, and when the commandos took off on the plane, he wrote two statements. One was explaining the success, the other was announcing his resignation. He was going to bear responsibility for whatever was decided. These four understood that being prime minister meant you, you bore the weight of decision-making and responsibility Ariel Sharon used to write about the solitude of the leader, meaning you can have people who are there as advisors, but you're the one who bears the weight uh, of the decision-making and the responsibility. So their definition of leadership meant A, responsibility, you assumed it. B, you didn't defer decisions that were important. You made the decisions. This wasn't something that you would defer to your successor and let them bear the weight and the political blowback. All four of these adopted the same attitude. They had the ability and, the, and the, the kind of instinctive approach to say, we have to define priorities. We have to look around the, the bend and realize what's important. We have to think strategically. We have to be governed by the, act, the, the risks of acting, but not just the risks of acting. What happens when you don't act? What are the consequences of not acting? One of the reasons that Golda Meir didn't make the cut uh, is because she twice before the 73 war, she prevented first Rabin, who was the uh, Israeli ambassador to the United States, and then later Dayan, who was a defense minister. Each of them came up with ideas about how to respond to Anwar Sadat uh, in terms of an in in interim agreement, and she, and she vetoed it each time. Uh, had either of those happened, you probably wouldn't have had the 73 war. She saw the cost of acting and the risk of acting and didn't see the cost of inaction. So these were leaders who had all these attributes, but they also had something else. They put the country first, not the party first. Uh, they, they recognized that they had a responsibility to lead, that as leaders, if your public isn't where it needs to be on something that's truly important, you have a responsibility to explain the stakes. Uh, and all of them did this. All of them made a journey, all of them evolved, all of them ended up taking decisions with the exception of Ben-Gurion, who's in a somewhat different place because there wasn't a state yet, but he declares a state. And again, maybe in the q and I can describe just how difficult it was to make that decision. Uh, but all of these leaders, meaning the other three, Begin and Rabin uh, and Sharon did things that seemed out of character because they decided the country had to come first. Uh, and so the idea with writing about this history was to provide guidelines for Israel's leaders today, and also a source of inspiration to see where Israel has come from. It is an extraordinary story. I said it's an amazing country. You look at these leaders and what they contended with and the decisions they made, the big decisions they made, uh, and it's inspiring, but it also provides a kind of guidelines. Now along came the Trump plan, and you might think that, well, maybe that changed the need for this book. And after all, in the end, they came out with a plan that called for two states. So, you know, I should have said, ah, great. They read the book, they made the decision. The only problem was the plan makes two states less likely, not more likely. It makes separation close to impossible because what the plan does uh, is basically two things. The plan absorbs not just the settlements within the blocks that permit separation, it absorbs all 130 settlements. There are 52 settlements in what I would describe as a settlement blocks. I say that because the blocks, there's never been a, a specific definition. There's no agreed definition. I can give you mine, but it's an easier, the, the rule of thumb we use for the book is the security barrier. It was largely the, whose idea, it was Rabin's idea to do the barrier. Uh, and, it was, and it was Sharon who in the end uh, who acted on building it. And the barrier is on about 8% of the West Bank, not five or 6%, but 8% of the West Bank closest to the Green Line. So as a, as a rough rule of thumb right now, if you don't build outside to the areas to the east of the barrier, uh, you, know, you, you are protecting 52 settlements that will always be part of Israel, but there's another 78 that are outside the block. Now, when I say that more than 80% uh, of the settler population is within this area, the truth is, 
with the 8%, you get 85% of all the settlers. So 85% of the settlers are in 52 uh, of the settlements. There's 15% of the settler population is in the 78 settlements are outside to the east of settlement block, which tells you a lot. There's a large number of small settlements. Uh, what the Trump plan does, it absorbs all 78 of the settlements outside. The reason the Palestinian state is both divided up into small blotches of territory is to accommodate 63 of those settlements. And then there's another 15 that will be in the Palestinian state itself, but under Israeli sovereignty. And how that would work in practical terms, you know, someone who's been on the ground a lot, I have no idea. So the first reason that the Trump plan doesn't make two states more likely is by absorbing all the settlements, you're going to make separation, physical separation between Israelis and Palestinians very difficult. The second reason that it's, that it makes it, uh, that adds to the difficulty is that it, there's no independent border for the Palestinians. They will be surrounded by Israel. They will be in an island, uh, but disconnected from any Arab state. Now, I understand the reason it was done, which was to, to give Israel sovereignty in the Jordan Valley. Now, there's an interesting point here. Yitzhak Rabin always talked about the security, the security border for Israel was the Jordan River. The security border, not the political border, meaning Israel needed a presence there. And I accept that. But you don't need to have sovereignty to have a presence there. I was part of a back channel after I left the, the Obama administration uh, where we came up with, one of the ideas we came up with was Israel would have a 100-year lease uh, in the Jordan Valley. So symbolically, psychologically, the Palestinians would have sovereignty, but Israel would have its practical needs met. What was done with the Trump plan was by uh, giving Israel sovereignty in the, in the Jordan Valley, it, the combination of that and the absorption of, of all the settlements has made this map look very unappealing to Palestinians. Forget the leadership, which isn't capable of doing anything. It's very unappealing to Palestinians. Their attitude increasingly is, look, that's, we'd rather just be part of Israel. Just give us the vote. And that's unfortunately what one state for two people means. Uh, and that threatens the very identity uh, of Israel. Israel faces these other threats I talked about from Iran, ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda, Shia, Hezbollah, Hamas, that are very tangible and real. But there's also another threat to Israel. Uh, and, and that threat may be less tangible. It's a threat to Israeli identity, uh, but it's no less real. Uh, and what this debate over annexation right now relates to that, because Bibi, on the one hand, is saying he wants to, he wants to absorb all 30% of the West Bank that the Trump plan allots to Israel. Uh, there's deep opposition within the, uh, I mean, many of the former generals in Israel. Uh, we're also hearing that the Shin Bet and the IDF right now are raising real questions about this. Uh, they're raising questions related to what they see as a potential threatening backlash. I'm raising questions that absorbing this 30% will, I suspect, make it very difficult to end up with anything but one state for two people. Uh, and either you give the Palestinians equal rights or you deny them the rights and then you change the character of Israel in either direction. Either it loses its democratic character or it loses its Jewish character. Annexation unless the annexation is kept to being very minimal and only in those areas that would be a part of Israel in any conceivable agreement. Again, take the Clinton parameters where 5% of the West Bank was going to be absorbed. Uh, take the Omert approach where 6.5% of the West Bank was going to be absorbed. Um, those were realistic approaches to producing an outcome, and they made two states and a separation possible. Uh, we can get into the Q&A because I don't want to take up too much time because if I take up too much time, all you're doing is hearing me talk and I don't get to hear what really is on your mind. Uh, and I suspect there are issues other than only the ones I'm talking about that are on your mind. Uh, so I don't want to belabor this, but let me just close by saying the annexation debate is a critical debate because I do think it's going to have, it will very much affect Israel's future. Uh, I want to close by saying, why is Bibi doing it? He's doing it because he sees it as his kind of Ben-Gurion moment. Uh, when he was, uh, 
when I was negotiating the Hebron Accord with him one night, just two of us were in his office and he said to me out of the blue, I'm going to do what Ben Gurion did. And because he was, you know, he was a product of the revisionist movement, I re reflexively responded by saying, you mean Begin? And he said, no, no, I mean Ben Gurion. Ben Gurion did the big stuff. Bibi thinks he's going to redefine the baseline, redefine Israel's borders in a way that will be enduring. Uh, and if I thought that would be the case and it was sustainable, I'd be more sympathetic to it. But the problem is no one else is going to recognize uh, this. Maybe the Trump administration will recognize it. But if the Trump administration is gone come January, then you're likely going to have a reversal. So the gain is illusory. Uh, it's not real. And the risks, whether it's to Israel's identity, whether it's to the, the possibility uh, of um, uh, whether it's to the possibility uh, of preserving two states or the, or the Palestinian Authority collapsing, uh, in which case Israel then has to assume responsibility for 2.6 million Palestinians in the West Bank. There's a series of different risks and the gains, as I said, are illusory. So why don't I pause there and we can talk about anything you want to talk about, including uh, the intelligence related to the Russians giving the Taliban bounties uh, to kill American soldiers, just to show that there's so little we could talk about. Okay, uh, I'm open to the questions. I, I can, I'm happy to just look at the chat function and respond to what I see. Um, I have one question that is, was I consulted on the Trump plan? The answer is, I was, um, um, I was, yes, I had extensive conversations uh, with Jared Kushner, with Jason Greenblatt, uh, I gave them my thoughts both on the substance and on the process, uh, and I think it's um, I think it's fair to say that they must have been able to restrain their enthusiasm for some of my advice. But uh, no, to be fair, they reached out to me a fair amount. Uh, it's just I don't feel that in the end. I think they feel. I mean, I, I have no question about their sincerity. I think this was a they were sincere in terms of what they were trying to do, and I still believe that's the case. And it's why one of the reasons I think they're holding back right now on giving Bibi a green light, because Jared in particular views annexation as a lever to get the Palestinians to engage. David Friedman, I think, views annexation as an end in itself. Uh, Jared Kushner has said publicly, this is a holistic plan. It's a package deal. Uh, you find something very interesting. Uh, here, Ron Dermer, the Israeli ambassador, writes an article in the Washington Post where he talks about the Trump plan being the only realistic plan to a two-state approach. But all of Bibi's surrogates in Israel are saying explicitly, and I can give you the names of people, um, and these are, these are people who are Bibi surrogates and they could, they're explicitly saying there'll be no Palestinian state. So, it's, so Bibi and the people around him are taking the Trump plan as, like, as if it's a buffet, where they take the part they want, but you know, the Trump plan actually has 10% uh, of what would make up the Palestinian state uh, are swap areas from the Negev. So they, they get about 80%, they have a state that's about 80% of what was the overall territory from June 467, 10% of, of that comes from areas in Israel that are next to the Negev, I mean, that are, that are next to Gaza. Uh, the rest comes from the West Bank. You don't hear anyone in Israel talking about the swap areas. Uh, you don't hear, you have people around Bibi saying, you know, there'll be no state. These are Likud people. Forget the the op he's facing opposition from uh, part of the settlement uh, settlement leaders, not all of them. Those who live within one of the block areas like the Trump plan. Those who live outside the block areas don't like the Trump plan, especially those who live in the 15 that would be in the Palestinian state. Uh, so you don't hear any talk from uh, from Bibi or the people around him referring to the Palestinian state. The only one who's saying you should accept the whole plan is Benny Gantz, who says, I like the whole plan. Uh, so we'll see where this goes. Um, okay, I have another. I'm just going to go ahead and see what I see in the chat area. Is that fine with you in terms of responding? Is that okay? All right. It's so, great. Um, um, yeah, I see that Shlomo Cohen has a hand raised, but I'm. I, so I can go to the hand raise function as opposed to chat if you want. 
okay? Can I ask my question? Yeah, go ahead. Negotiations have been going off and on for many, many years. And the Trump plan seems as though it's getting away from that process, from the way of doing it. I yeah. would like you to follow up a little bit. Do you think there's actually a possibility that this plan, although it may not be implemented, but could lead to negotiations? Would it prompt the Palestinians? Would it encourage them to enter into negotiations? Uh, I guess the, the honest answer to that is uh, no. The question is, if there were a second Trump term, would they come back to it? And I don't think anybody can answer that for sure. I mean, look, we have a legacy with the Palestinians about never coming up with counter proposals, but they didn't negotiate in the past. Uh, one element, one of the motivations behind those who shaped the Trump plan was a motivation that I very much agreed with, which was the Palestinians need to understand that if you always say no and you never engage, there's a consequence and you lose. You don't gain, you're going to lose what's available to you. And I'm not against that in principle, but I'm against doing it unless you've prepared the ground and created legitimacy for it. Here that wasn't done because the details of the Trump plan were never shared with any of the Arab leaders, which was a huge mistake. And obviously one of my advice, one bit of advice I gave was share the details with Arab leaders because you Sunni Arab leaders today view Israel through a very different lens. They see Israel as a natural partner, even if they won't admit it publicly because of the Palestinian issue still. Nonetheless, privately, they work very closely with Israel in a way that would have been unthinkable before. And they were looking for a way to basically be responsive to the plan, but you couldn't just spring the plan on them without sharing the details. And if they, and my advice was share the details. If you do it only with a leader, it won't leak. Uh, take a few of their comments so they feel some degree of ownership and then work out privately with them what they'll say word for word in public after you unveil it. When you have that and they say something along the lines, this is a serious basis for negotiations, take that to the Europeans because the Europeans won't be more Arab than the Arabs. And then you have them lined up publicly saying this is a serious basis for negotiation. That then puts the Palestinians, the Palestinian leadership in an impossible position. If they say no, they can't sustain the no because they'll face pressure from their own public under those circumstances. How can you turn down something that our, our historic traditional supporters are saying is a serious basis for negotiations? But that wasn't done, and it made it easy for the Palestinians to say no. You want to change Palestinian behavior, make it hard for them to say no by creating a context. The context wasn't laid for the Trump plan. Now, if there's a second term, could that change things? Maybe. If there's not a second term, um, then the prospect of engaging on the Trump plan is zero, because I suspect in a Biden administration, even though Biden is instinctive an instinctive supporter of Israel in a way that I know better than everyone else because I was in lots of battles when I was in the Obama administration and the only person who supported me on every single one of them was Joe Biden, every single one without exception. Uh, and uh, even though he's an instinctive friend of Israel, uh, he's likely to repudiate the Trump plan uh, and not likely to recognize annexation, which he's already come out and said, I oppose all unilateral steps, whether it's the Palestinians declaring statehood or Israel doing annexation, in the end, there needs to be a negotiation. Uh, I would act in ways to increase the Palestinian incentive to negotiate by showing that they have something to lose, but by creating legitimacy for the move, showing that it is something that is embraced by others. As I said, don't make it easy for them to say no, and unfortunately, that's what was done this time. Um, okay, I have, so now I'm just gonna go down to chat function. Bibi has said Iran will never get nukes. What is he prepared to do? Is he bluffing? It is a really interesting question because um, the Iranians, after the Trump administration walked away from the JCPOA, uh, while the Trump administration has been extremely effective in terms of raising the cost to the Iranians, and life is very difficult in Iran now. Even, even before COVID, it was very difficult. More difficult now because our sanctions basically uh, have been, maybe other governments haven't embraced them, but the private sector internationally and banks internationally have embraced them because they are not given the choice of doing business with us or with Iran, guess who they choose? They don't want to lose doing business, the ability to do business with us. 
So life has become very hard, but it hasn't changed Iran's behavior. In the region, uh, Israel, just by my count, in the last five weeks, Israel has carried out 10, they don't admit it, but they've carried out 10 major strikes uh, into Syria, attacking what is the infrastructure uh, of, that Iran is building in Syria, including factories they're trying to, to, to fabricate to produce the, what amounts to um, a GPS system to put on the type of missiles, it has 130,000 rockets. And the, the whole point of what Iran is trying to do with the precision guided project is to basically put terminal guidance on all the rockets they provided to Hezbollah. Israel can't live with that. This is not a debating issue. They can't live with it. It's a small country with a limited number of high value strategic targets, both militarily and economically. And so Israel is acting to try to blunt this. Uh, and that continues, Iran continues that project, notwithstanding pressure. Uh, this past week, the Houthis using uh, drones and, and rockets have been given to them by the Iranians and that they have Hezbollah and, and uh, Quds, Force, uh, Quds Force people on the ground to help them. This week they hit, they hit Riyadh uh, with drones and, and rockets. Um, you know, the, uh, what they're doing within Iraq is designed to, I mean, this past week, interesting enough, the Iraqi military stopped uh, Qutayb Hezbollah, one of the leading Shia proxies for the Iranian, militia proxies for the Iranians in, in Iraq. They actually stopped an attack that was about to be staged with rockets against one of the bases where our forces are in Iraq. They actually then arrested the 14 guys from Qutayb Hezbollah uh, who were who were staging this, but now they have released them because of pressure uh, from this militia and with Iranian backing. So Iran hasn't stopped anything it's doing in the region. Uh, and uh, whereas the JCPOA, which by the way, just so you know, I never actually endorsed it. I didn't oppose it. I didn't endorse it. We can get into the reasons why. I had problems with it. But the JCPOA kept the breakout time for the Iranians, breakout to being able to produce fissile nuclear weapons, weapons grade fissile material, to one year. Now the Iranians have withdrawn from it because we withdrew from it. Uh, and they're now down to four months breakout time. Now Bibi was incessant in, in criticizing Obama. Uh, there, he doesn't say a word about Trump, even as the breakout time is now down to four months and will decline further. And I can go through the reasons for that if you want. So back to your question, what is he prepared to do? What he clearly hoped is that we would do it. Um, in the Bolton book, Bolton says that Trump said to him, tell him we'll, you know, we'll support what you do, meaning that we won't do it, but you do it. And, and Bolton in his book says he didn't know what does support mean? You know, we'll say nice job and we'll clap we'll do something more specific. Um, the irony is Bibi is in a position where it isn't the US, as long as Trump is here, that's gonna do it. Uh, he may be put in a position where he may have to do it. He may have to hope that in a Biden administration, more is done to arrest this possibility. Uh, but uh, do I think he's bluffing? I think he genuinely believes that Iran must never have nuclear weapons. I think that's the right position uh, it is the rhetorical position of the Trump administration. It was the, it was also the rhetorical position of the Obama administration. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, is he bluffing? I don't know. I think he believes what he says. Uh, I think he prefers for someone else to do it. And I think there's also a reason why he prefers for us to do it. Israel has a lot of capability, but it doesn't have the capability we have. And one of the things that the Iranians have is they built uh, one of their uh, one of their enrichment sites is built into a mountain, and bunker bunker busters don't work against a mountain. They work against hardened facilities, but not against a mountain. Uh, the Fordo site is built in a mountain next to Cone, uh, and the Obama administration developed something called the Massive Ordnance Penetrator, which is a thirty thousand pound bomb with a fuse that ignites only after it's underground. It was developed explicitly to hit this target. 
if we had to use force if diplomacy failed. It's a non-nuclear device. Normally to take out a mountain, you would need a nuclear device. This is a non-nuclear device. And one of the recommendations I made, I, Obama, not surprisingly, because I, you know, I had a responsibility for Iran in the first term. He very much wanted me to come out publicly for the deal. And I had a number of conditions, one of which was to give the Israelis the massive ordnance penetrator. But also because the Israelis don't have a plane that can carry it, given the 30,000 pound weight, I said we needed to lease the Israelis B-2 bombers. Uh, so that the value of doing this was it would send a message to the Iranians, a deterrent message. If you doubt that we'll do it, you know the Israelis will do it. But we are giving them the means that they lack to take out one of the key sites that they would have to be able to hit. Uh, you know, I would, this is something if there's a Biden administration, I would recommend because the Iranians have to see that this could happen. If you want to deter them, they have to see that it could happen. And I'm worried that they are moving towards a position where them having a nuclear weapon uh, may well become possible. It's not possible immediately. Even the, the four months as opposed to a year doesn't to say the whole story because we don't know if they have, if they've actually fashioned the ability to take weapons grade uranium and turn it into a sphere, a, a, a cylinder, uh, and encase it uh, in, a, in material that makes it a bomb. Uh, and we know from what the Israelis, this 55,000 documents that they, they ferreted out of Tehran, we know that they were working on being able to weaponize uh, fissile material. We know that they, were, they did experiments with something called a neutron initiator, which is what you need if you're going to set in motion a chain reaction. Uh, you need a neutron initiator that basically shoots a neutron uh, into uh, what is the, the material and it basically sets in motion a chain reactor, I mean, a chain reaction. So we know they were working on that, but nobody knows for sure, including the Israelis, exactly where they are in terms of that process. Uh, so it's, it's probably more than four months, uh, but you know you have to worry that they could be at a point where they could suddenly present the world with a fait accompli, and you don't want to be at that point. So uh, we will need to be doing something different than, than the Trump administration is doing right now. Uh, Dennis, you have a, a question on the phone from Harris DeVore. Harris? Okay. Hi. Um, I, hopefully you can hear me. I'm, I'm called in as opposed to appearing in person on Zoom. But um, I, I, Ambassador Ross, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, it's uh, wonderful to hear you. So, um, you know, my question is, uh, with all the talk about the Trump plan, which obviously has all the reasons and excuses for why the Palestinians would reject it, um, including the fact that, you know, now we're down to 70 percent or something. Um, the fact of the matter is that more times than I can count, they've rejected 90 plus percent. Yeah. So at, at, at what point do you take a step back and say, you know, this isn't about territory. This isn't about borders. This is this is almost I, I hate to say it, almost a ethnic or religious war that has been going on for much longer and will not be resolved by the seeding of certain territory, whatever, because the criticism that, especially on the left, um, of which I'm actually part of the left, you know, it just seems to all be how this is a non-starter, but they never mention the fact that, well, 95% was also a non-starter. So, yeah. so therefore, you know, maybe this plan isn't so bad. Anyway, I'll, I'll shut up and listen to your answer. Thank you. Yeah, no, look, I think uh, as I'm, I said earlier, A, I don't believe that uh, two states is possible anytime soon because I don't think the Palestinians are capable of negotiating at any time soon, uh, partly because Abu Mazen is not and partly because we're going to have a succession process at some point soon. He's 85 years old. He suffers from hypertension. He continues to smoke. This is not a prescription for living. So you're not going to have him. And by the way, all the people around him right now are positioning himself for succession. And succession periods are not characterized by moderation and accommodation. 
So you're not going to be able to negotiate anytime soon. The issue is Israel shouldn't take steps that precludes having it later on when maybe it could become possible. So if it's not possible at this stage, the right focus is not on a big plan. That was a mistake also. You can't negotiate two states anytime soon. Why put out a big plan? Why not focus on changing the conditions on the ground, trying to create the circumstances where something more is possible than is, than, uh, than is possible today and create the context where two states could be, could it be possible later on? I'm a big believer in, you know, in, in my approach would be if I were doing what I used to do, I would basically go to the Israelis, go to the Palestinians, go to the Arabs and, and lay out a set of uh, uh, proposals where they would not have to agree with each other, they'd have to agree with us. So that no one have to concede to the other. Because right now, Israelis can't concede anything to Palestinians, Palestinians can't concede anything to Israelis. Uh, and the Arabs, it's a more interesting dynamic, but unlikely also easier for them to concede to us than to the Israelis. And I would say, look, Israel, you stop building outside the blocks and you declare there'll be no Israeli sovereignty to the east of the barrier, consistent with your security needs. Uh, we put that in our pocket, but we say to the Palestinians, this is what we're prepared to push for from the, and get from the Israelis, what we need from you. Israel's doing two things, we need two things from you. First, you stop pay for slay. Meaning, Palestinian Authority gives priority to the to priority payments to the families of those who are in Israeli jails for carrying out acts of terror or violence against Israelis. Uh, and they are given pride of place in terms of money and they're given more money. And the, and the stipend they get per month is greater the longer their relative is in Israeli jails. As Shin Bet has said in interrogations, when asked why it was done, they frequently say, because this could take care of my family. That's pay for slay, it has to end. Not a debating issue, it has to end. So they have to stop pay for slave and they have to publicly acknowledge there's a historic Jewish connection to the land. They do those two things. And then, the, and then the Arabs, they take what they're doing below the table and they put it on top of the table. And they say, so the, so the Saudis send an official delegation to Jerusalem to talk about common security concerns with the Israelis. All right, now you, in private you do that. And you also go to the Europeans at the same time. And you say to the Europeans, this is what we're doing. Uh, and we need you to back us. If you want us to follow through on it, you need to back us. Uh, and they want us. The thing is, the Europeans are desperate to have to do this thing that they think could actually work. So in these circumstances, if the Israelis are prepared to go ahead and do it, uh, and the Palestinians won't do it, it then depends on what the Arabs are prepared to do. But let's say neither the Palestinians or the Arabs do it. They would know, again, in this private discussion, that if you don't take these steps, we will recognize the block areas. Now we'll recognize them in a way where it says the, the final borders related to the block areas was, must still be negotiated and agreed, but you need to understand the block areas we now will treat as being part of Israel uh, and uh, with the borders to be refined. Now that would also be part of our discussion with the Europeans in advance. In other words, what I'm saying is, this is I said earlier, create legitimacy for your actions. Don't do it in a way that feeds, that will feed the delegitimization movement, which by the way, if there's annexation, you, this is gonna be a huge boost to the BDS movement worldwide and on our campuses here. Uh, don't act in a way that does that. Uh, be smart about this and in a way that, in a sense, sends a message that the Palestinians do have something to lose uh, if they're never prepared to negotiate or, or even if they're prepared to negotiate, but they never change their posture and they're never prepared to concede anything. So my, I guess my long-winded answer to your question is, there is something that can be done, uh, even along the lines of what you're suggesting, but it has to be done very differently. It has to be done in a way that gives you a chance actually to succeed at something, use the potential of our recognition as a lever in private, uh, and then be prepared to act on it so it's not a bluff. I mean, I'm a big believer, you don't bluff. What you do in private, at some point you back up in public, but you prepare the ground for what you, say in public by, uh, by doing things in private, including uh, with the Europeans and others. You, you know, bring in the Europeans, bring in the Japanese, bring in the South Koreans, create a kind of international acceptance for what you're doing. Uh, and that's possible, that unfortunately hasn't been done. Okay, let's see. Um, do I believe that anything substantive can actually happen with all parties focused on party versus country, wouldn't this, in your opinion, change in a Biden administration? Uh, well, let me just put it this way. 
it needs to change. I mean, it, we are going to have, so long as everything is polarized here, so long as there's no effort to work uh, across party lines, uh, we're going to continue to be paralyzed in terms of doing things even domestically that matter to us. You know, this is, uh, uh, from the standpoint of the U.S. position in the world, we no longer even have soft power. We haven't been competent in terms of our response to the pandemic, so we're hardly a model in that respect. Uh, but so long as it looks like we can't get things done even domestically, we lose our soft power. We're, we were a source of attraction. Uh, that, by the way, has huge dividends internationally because it makes the objectives that you adopt much more likely to be accepted by others, not even without having to make a major effort. You still need to make some diplomacy is something you should, in fact, use. And diplomacy isn't you do it my way or forget it. Diplomacy is listening to the other side and then taking advantage of your soft power to, to get them to do what you want. Uh, and so uh, my answer to your question is it has to change. Uh, and if it doesn't change, we're going to be in deeper trouble. Um, if annexation goes forward, how will, how will it impact U.S.? I guess you're asking how is U.S. relation, oh, U.S. aid to Israel. I don't see it affecting USAID. If Biden comes in, Biden will not, uh, he will not, and he said this publicly, he would not uh, cut American aid to Israel. Uh, the only aid we give is military aid. We stop giving economic aid. You know, Israel is a country with a $400 billion GDP. Uh, it has a per capita income uh, the same as uh, most European states now. Uh, so we don't give economic assistance to Israel, but we do give uh, military assistance to Israel, I mean, which amounts to, um, uh, this is the Obama assistance, Trump hasn't added to it, even though Israel's expenses, as it relates to carrying out these, uh, all the air attacks they carry out, stand-up attacks they carry out, carry out against what the Iranians are trying to do uh, in Syria, um, all of these attacks that are carried out, and even what is done to, stop, to respond to what happened in Gaza or from Gaza, uh, most of that was not programmed in to the $3.8 billion a year that the Obama administration concluded for 10 years with Israel. Um, I, I actually, I do a, I do a annual briefing of the Israeli cabinet, the prime minister and the whole cabinet, and I raise the idea, look, why not Trump says that we're countering malign Iranian activities in the region. We're not, you are. Why not go to, to Trump and say um, the, the money, the Obama monies, which are much appreciated and 3.8 billion a year is a lot. Uh, but you know, while we program in some money related to that, uh, we've had to do much more than we thought we would have to do. And we're the ones, and everyone in the region sees, we're the only ones who are actively blunting what the Iranians are doing on the ground. No one else is, only us. So, and this costs us. You have to understand the, the standoff systems the Israelis use are very effective and they're also high, they are highly expensive. Uh, so that's not, you know, the Trump administration hasn't given Israel one penny more uh, and Israel hasn't asked for it. Um, you know, I, I would ask for it, but uh, that may reflect the way they see Trump and how he views uh, transactions. Uh, uh, in any case, um, you know, I do, I think that uh, there will not be a cut in assistance if there's, if there's a Biden administration. But as I said, I think that there, anything the Trump administration recognizes is unlikely to be recognized. By the way, this is unfortunate. In the past, presidential commitments were recognized and respected. President Obama uh, revoked our recognition of the, uh, of the Bush uh, Sharon letter from 2004, which was part of the process of Israel withdrawing from Gaza. Huge mistake in my mind. Uh, it was done before I, I, my initial responsibilities were only on Iran. I was then asked to go over, actually not one, after one year, after six months to the White House and take a responsibility for dealing with all the Middle East issues. Uh, and I got over there and this has been done. And I explained, this is a huge mistake. The minute you go ahead and you revoke a presidential commitment, 
the message is no presidential commitment is enduring. It's good only for the administration. Uh, but on this, in this case, I think it's highly likely that, the, that we will not recognize, if the Trump administration goes ahead and does recognize annexation, um, I do, I suspect that, um, you know, it's very, very likely that Biden will reverse our recognition. No one else is going to recognize internationally except for the Trump administration. Uh, can I say something about infrastructure? Right now, water is a big issue in the area because of control issues. Further electric infrastructure and controls are an issue. How can there be clear, div clean division of two states? I suspect that you're a person moving forward with approaches to make it. Uh, separation and, uh, and sovereignty. Uh, look, separation can take different forms. You know, uh, you can create certain common infrastructure. And let me, I'll give you an example that even goes beyond infrastructure. Israel cannot give up control of the aquifers that are in the West Bank because they feed directly into the aquifers in Israel. Here, there can't be a separation. You know, the water today, 96% of the water in Gaza is undrinkable because the aquifers there have been exploited too much. So the water's become very brackish. Uh, if the Palestinians uh, exploited their aquifers the same way and it would seep into the, it would, it, would, it would corrupt the Israeli aquifers, that's not tenable. So when I say separation, I'm talking about physical separation. I'm not say talking about uh, separation in terms of all practical forms, uh, you know, look at what the, the level of cooperation between Israel and the, and the PA and even Gaza uh, on COVID-19. It's been extraordinary. Uh, you know, the, the Israelis allowed 40,000 Palestinians who normally would be day laborers to stay for two months in Israel uh, so that they could remain employed. Uh, you know, the idea that the Palestinians won't be sending workers into Israel, you know, almost a quarter of their GDP is underwritten by the Palestinians who work in Israel, either work in Israel or work in the settlements. Uh, so separation, I don't think economic separation is so practical. Uh, if you wanted economic separation, you, this would take 10 years to gradually work out. When I talk separation, I'm talking physical separation so that you can actually have uh, two different states. But those two different states, there's no reason why they can't cooperate extensively. Uh, when I talk about, by the way, security, the idea that the Palestinians would be able to secure themselves against threats is an illusion. They're not going to be permitted to have an army. Uh, and even those states that have long-standing military security traditions, Jordan and Egypt, I will, I will simply say it in the following way. They depend much more on Israel than anybody knows. Now, they have a tradition, they have capability, they have weapon systems, you know, they have coherence in their military. Uh, the Palestinians will have none of that. Uh, so the idea that they would be responsible for their own security from external threats is an illusion. They will be responsible for their security internally. They will not be responsible for the security externally because they're not in a position to handle that. Uh, how is the increasing power of the religious right in Israel impacting Israel and more importantly, American Jewish support for Israel? Uh, it's damaging. You know, I mean, there was, it took three and a half years to work out a compromise uh, on access to, to the Western Wall. Uh, and then because of the opposition of religious right, Bibi backed away because the religious right is so important to his government. Uh, and, you know, the... Uh, there's no give on conversion. There's no give on recognition of, of the non-Orthodox streams. It has a, it has a terrible effect uh, on the Jewish community here. Uh, and, you know, there isn't there, there what is surprising is about 10% of, of uh, Israel's Jewish population now take part in maybe four or five events a year that are run by the Masorti movement, meaning the conservative slash reform movement. So there is some interesting potential for change in Israel because of this, uh, but you also need an Israeli government that is prepared to, to draw limits. 
one of the interesting one of the interesting realities about Abigdor Lieberman, he basically, you know, he's on the right side of the political spectrum, but he has run as someone who says we can't be a halakhic state. Uh, and, um, you know, and I would say, you know, he, uh, he has eight mandates in the Knesset, which is, you know, which means that he got about 100,000 more votes than he ever got before. Uh, so it says something that there is, it's, it's not the central issue in Israel, but it's a factor in Israel, and it does have an effect here, for sure. Do I foresee any change in leadership or status of Gaza? Also, how do you think the new leadership plan with Netanyahu and Gantz will work? So let me take the, uh, the last part first, uh, delicately. Um, it's complicated. I do think that um, Bibi right now, Gantz is using the fact that the administration requires consensus between he and uh, and Bibi before giving a green light uh, to annexation. And that is pushing annexation in a, in a more, in a smaller direction, I believe, meaning it won't be the 30%. I do believe it'll end up being within the blocks. It still requires a kind of framing to, to give it some, to reduce the, or minimize some of the costs. Um, but Gantz is, feels empowered on this issue because of that. He made a statement that July 1, he said, there's no holy dates here. Uh, and our focus should be on COVID. It shouldn't be on annexation right now, which, by the way, is where the public is. The public is not paying. They're, look, Israel has a million people unemployed. It now has, a, it's surging again in terms of, uh, of, the, of the virus. Um, that's where Israel needs to be putting its attention. But that's what he said publicly. Bibi had made July 1 the date where he was going to, he wanted to start the process of, of implementing, implementing, and he doesn't have he doesn't have a green light at this point from the administration. Uh, he's in a sense threatening people around him are threatening new elections and Gans's numbers, Bill White's numbers. You know, Gans by going in the government absolutely divided the opposition. The opposition is completely divided right now, uh, and uh, and so and his numbers have dropped precipitously because a lot of the people who voted for him feel betrayed by this. Most of them were voting against Bibi and, and he said he wouldn't serve in a government if Bibi was indicted and Bibi has been indicted and he is. Now he, his argument was uh, COVID basically was such a national emergency that everything else was secondary. Uh, but in negotiating with Netanyahu, the one exception to, to put it into not doing anything other than COVID related actions for six months was annexation. Bibi made it a condition. Gantz, I would say, did not negotiate in a way where he used the leverage that he had. He didn't have to go into the government. Uh, he didn't have to do an agreement until this was agreed. Well, anyway, he conceded on this point, but he required, and Bibi agreed, that there had to be uh, acceptance, agreement with the Americans before annexation could proceed. And these weren't conditions, but Bibi also agreed that there had to be discussions about the consequences for the peace agreements with Egypt and Jordan. There had to be discussions on the impact on security and stability also before this was done. Only the only agreement with the, with the administration was a condition. The other two uh, were not conditions, but they had to be, there had to be discussions. Uh, so, you know, I don't believe that BB, I believe this is a bluff for new elections. Uh, the polls might look good to him right now, but BB, nobody is more seasoned and a master of the political reality of Israel than Bibi Netanyahu. And he knows that uh, for the first time, he's getting poor marks on what he's doing on the economy. Uh, he may wanna share the responsibility in this government, but it's hard to believe that, you know, if, if, uh, if COVID is, is this problem and isn't gonna go away for the next several months, that you have an election in say in four months, who knows what the outcome would be? Uh, so I don't think Bibi is about to risk that. I don't think, I think he's bluffing on, on going to election, but I could be wrong. And if you're Gantz and you're worried about what it means, maybe you'll concede. Uh, that said, I think both have a reason to keep the government functioning. Uh, and I think COVID gives them an enormous incentive uh, to share the responsibility for dealing with this. So even though I think it'll be complicated, I don't think, I don't think this government will go away soon.
uh, how big a problem is Qatar as it relates to Gaza? Oh, I didn't answer the first part of the question on leadership or status in Gaza. Look, Gaza is controlled by Hamas, and there's no prospect of changing that anytime soon. Uh, Israel's not going to go militarily in there to remove them. Uh, Egypt's not going to do it. Um, Gaza is led by, um, uh, by a member of Hamas uh, who uh, not only is from there, but spent, 20, spent over 20 years in Israeli jails uh, and is fluent in Hebrew. Um, he seems to be more focused on uh, restoring some of the, getting a minimal level of economic uh, subsistence again in Gaza. You know, here you have 50% unemployment in Gaza. Uh, you have close to 70% unemployment of those between the ages of 18, 20 and 18 and 29. I said, 96% of the water is undrinkable. Um, they have, now they have 14 hours a day of electricity. I can assure you being in Gaza during this time of year with 14 hours a day of electricity is much better than the four hours a day they had, but it still is awful. Uh, he's trying to get at least to a subsistence level. Uh, and um, uh, so he doesn't really have an interest in blowing things up, but he does have an interest in, in in pushing terror in the West Bank. Uh, and Israel doesn't have an interest in blowing things up in Gaza, which is why the Netanyahu government has allowed Qatar to go to basically come and travel and provide cash to Hamas. Uh, heavily criticized by some in the right wing, but again, showing Bibi's practicality. He doesn't want to blow up in Gaza. Gaza is a, a no-win proposition. If you're forced to go in and you'd have to, and to basically, uh, destroy Hamas, then you own Gaza again. And you will have an insurgency in Gaza against your presence sooner or later. It's only a matter of time. Uh, you know, nobody likes what's going on in Gaza, but nobody, nobody argues for going back and staying in Gaza. And yet uh, that's what happens if you go there. So uh, taking money from Qatar helps to sustain Hamas in Gaza, but also helps to sustain uh, a reality where uh, Hamas at this point doesn't have a huge incentive in having the what is the current situation collapse, meaning a, a general ceasefire with occasional breakdowns. Um, uh, Dennis, it, we we only booked you for an hour, and I, I don't want to um, over right. overextend. You're more than welcome to continuing answering questions. Well, so let me let me take one more, and then I, then I will wrap it up. I wasn't looking at the time, uh, but I do have other things I have to do. So, um, what do I think can be done to counter what's going on within the anti with within the Democratic Party and anti-Israeli sentiment there? Well, I have to say one of the reasons I think annexation is a terrible mistake is that I think it's going to weaken those who are within the center of the party and strengthen the left wing, which tends to view Israel through the lens of being a victimizer and the, and the Palestinians as victims. Um, the good news is that if you have a, a Biden administration, Biden's instincts are very much, uh, you know, he's fundamentally someone who emotionally is connected and supportive of Israel. And a lot of the key people around him uh, will reflect those views. But a lot of the younger people who will be brought in have different views and who, are, who come who are more affected by what is the, the left wing of the party. Uh, so I'm hoping that annexation actually doesn't take place or at least is deferred. Uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, the, the key challenge is to make the case that, you know, tell the whole story. I mean, what's amazing among, with many in the, in the, uh, on the left wing of the party, uh, they, have no clue what actually goes on with the Palestinians. You know, you just had a huge gay, gay pride parade in Israel. Uh, I often ask the question when I'm speaking, where do you think Palestinian gays go? They go to Tel Aviv because they're not welcome in the PA and they're certainly not, you know, in Gaza, forget it. Uh, you know, Israel's a startup nation. 
Um, you know, there is no free speech in the Palestinian Authority. There is no free media in the Palestinian Authority. There is enormous corruption in the Palestinian Authority. There's no rule of law there. One of the reasons there's enormous alienation on the ground among Palestinians and frustration is because of the corruption in the PA. I mean, the story of what the Palestinians are doing and that they've never made a counterproposal. It's, it's like, this, is, this would be complete news. So part of it is telling the story. You know, I have no problem being critical of the Israeli moves that I think are wrong. I have a problem with delegitimizing Israel. I have a problem uh, with ignoring how much the Palestinians have contributed to their own position. They've made being a victim a strategy. And the only problem with that is they've succeeded at ensuring that they'll always be a victim. So I think the one thing is we just have to do as good a job as we can of explaining the realities. Uh, and, you know, that's obviously something that I spent a lot of my life doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Ross, thank you so much for taking this past hour to be with us to share your insights and your analysis and to help us understand possibilities for moving forward for Israelis, for Palestinians. We're so grateful to you for being with us um, and our BZBI community. And thank you again to all of you for, for joining us for this past hour. We look forward to continuing our learning and continuing our conversations together. Okay, thanks. Be well, thank you so much. Bye.